Ready? Yep. All right. Ready? Welcome back to uh, Bills, Filibusters, and Hashtags presented by the We Vote Project. We've got a couple more lectures coming up. Uh, our next one looks looks really interesting just based upon the title that we have here, which is uh, Patrick Radigan on the uh, Digital Fourth Estate. I don't even know what that means. We'll find out soon. But the future of new media, he's going to look into his crystal ball. Patrick Radigan is a graduate student in the university here in the College of Journalism and Mass Communications, currently developing a sports media project called Corn Fed Sports as part of his master's work. That's pretty interesting. Radigan's worked as a multimedia journalist covering the Huskers since 2010 and has worked on a number of on-campus and international journalism projects, including lecturing at the Siegler International Youth Forum in Tiber. Russia on new media. Did I get that right? Kind of close. close enough. All right. Welcome me. Let's uh, welcome Patrick up to the stage. So as the person responsible for the stream, you're not going to see a lot of crazy tricks or anything. I can keep the camera on me so it all works. So I'm responsible for the live stream today as well. So you're not going to see anything too crazy um, or too fancy. But uh, I just want to start. I mean, obviously, uh, you said that, that uh, I'm a journalism student here. I, I graduated from this college. I'm still a master's student here. I'm just kind of working through my pro uh, professional project. Uh, but like you said, it's a project called Corn Fed Sports. Now, I know sports isn't necessarily the most, you know, it's kind of, sports and politics have a lot in common, but it's not necessarily the easiest to translate over. But the point of, of my project, the point of what we've done, and I, I can start with um, at, being at the Daily Nebraska. And that's where it started all for me. And I, was, I had a semester left in my undergrad. Um, I, I didn't really know what I was doing. I had to come back and figure out what I was going to do for my last semester at the Daily Nebraska. And based on kind of how um, senior staff decisions went and a couple other things went, I kind of had a realization. Now, a lot of people think I might have done this because you're upset, you leave a job, things like that. Um, I'd actually broken the system to the point where I was making more every month than the editor in chief. I held four senior staff positions, I wrote for every section of the paper. So I had a lot in front of me, but I realized that any idea that I had, anything that I wanted to get done, anything that I thought would really change how we did business at the Daily Nebraskan wouldn't work simply because the Daily Nebraskan existed. Because we had to print papers, because we had to have that editing process, because we had all this overhead, all this legacy media stuff that we were just learning ourselves and it was new to us, but it limited where we were at, it limited what we could do. And that's when I started Corn Fed Sports. So Corn Fed Sports just started up as a way, I mean, it basically just started as a way for me to get press passes and go to games and keep doing that kind of stuff and, and have a little bit of fun. But it, it evolved into realizing that without that overhead, without that um, that sense of having to worry about hitting the 10 o'clock broadcast, having to worry about when your show comes out for radio, having to worry about when you're printing newspapers and, and, and what time you have to get those stories in, that we were just free. We were free to cover what we wanted. We were free to cover the sports how we wanted. We were free to use social media any way we wanted because there was no, there was no overhead that just kept us where we're at. And that, that's the problem with legacy media today is that the system is built up to print papers. The system is built up to broadcast TV shows. The system is built up for traditional terrestrial radio broadcasts. But that's not where society is going, that mobile and, and all the things, and it's perfect to have Matt up here as part of the panel because everything he said is, is extremely applicable, including trolls. And in case you guys didn't know, those are the mean people online. They're, they're called trolls. So we didn't hear that term or lose earlier. Um, if you're noticing, I have my pink shirt on today. I used to have a better pink shirt that I thought was all cool that I wore for big things. And then somebody on YouTube commented how tight my buttons were down the middle. So that taught me a lot about how the internet works. It taught me a lot about how you, know, you have to operate on it. So if you notice, got a left space in this shirt, it's not an accident. So uh, you know, it's, 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 it's an interesting thing to learn when you get in that environment, when you learn what that means, what that means better. But what I realized is that it helped us do two distinct things. It helped us, one, provide as much coverage as you want anywhere. There's only so much in the land. There's only so much landscape in a newspaper. There's only so much you can print, that you can cover. But there's 24 varsity athletics here in Nebraska. That's hundreds of athletes. That's even hundreds more families, thousands of fans, thousands of you know 13 to 19 year old kids that look up to these athletes. Like they're their, you know, that, that's their professional sports. Nebraska is their professional sports in this state. That you know, Nebraska volleyball team has over 20,000 followers on Twitter, and most football programs struggle to hit 15,000. And so I realized that you know there's all these different environments, all these different teams, all these different arenas where people were hardly even touching what they could do. They were hardly even covering it. And it's because nobody wanted to see that on the news. Nobody wanted to see that in the newspaper. Nobody wanted to talk about it in the drive time talk show because they want to talk about what assistant coach tweeted what or what player did all this. And they realized, they, they stopped realizing that it's not just about who yells the loudest, who gets the most response from around, that we realized it's about serving the people around here. It's about serving the people that we see at games. 
It's about serving the people that are interested in Nebraska athletics and not interested in yelling about a coach, not interested about calling a radio show to complain about a host and those different things. And we were able to focus on the content. We were able to focus on the message. And it, it, it touched on this idea that's, that's just all over the place in new media and in journalism called hyperlocal. And that's what I love about Weevil. That's what I love about everything I heard today is it's, it's, it's about politics or local. Politics are about the people and, and making a difference. And that, that's what media is about. The media is about serving the people around you, saying, how can I use my platform? And so the platform for me has always been sports. It's been softball. It's been soccer. It's been swimming and diving. It's been things that nobody else really gets that into. But I've realized that if you just give it a platform, if you give something that these athletes put hours and hours of work into, that people are going to be interested. And I see politics as the exact same way. Yeah, everybody wants to know what's happening at Pinnacle Bank Arena today. Everybody wants to know what's happening in all these big things with the governor and all stuff. But politics isn't about just the governor. It's not just about you know the, the presidential election. It's not just about the United States Congress. Politics is about everything. Politics is about how you interact. I got a ticket last night for dropping off um, for dropping off equipment in our office downtown. Even with my politics is about how you interact with your local parking department. It's about how they're accountable, how they're transparent. I mean, I wish somebody had a blog about all the things the parking department did wrong. If you could just list the tickets in a row that the parking department had and just look at that on its own, you'd learn a lot. You'd be like, oh, so this guy walks down this street and then goes back to the office because you can just see where it is. I mean, information is is everywhere. But as, until we realize that it's not just about the information, it's about journalists no more are, I need to go out there and ju- I'm the only one going to interview this guy. I'm the one who's going to get the story. Journalism is about taking information. It's about putting it in ways that other people can understand. And that's digital now. That, that's mobile now. That's all these different things. So it, it's just, it's so much different, the, 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 the climate we live in now. But it's not a bad thing. It, it empowers people. It empowers voices. It empowers communities. It empowers um, just everybody to do things in a different manner. Now, I'll give you two examples here before we kind of get into just some, some nuts and bolts, some kind of funner, funner stuff. That's my journalist right there, just using correct words. But um, when you look at the news, when you look at how news is spread, when you look at how news events play out, that it, it's not hard to pick what the, you know, the biggest news events recently have been. But when you look at how they correlate to what is being tweeted about, what's the different things like that. I, I gave a lecture actually in this classroom, and I went up there and I mentioned that uh, one of the most popular tweets of 2008 or 2010 or whatever it was, was a political tweet, just somebody like a, a celebration selfie that had nothing to do with it. Uh, it was a Justin Bieber tweet about his ex-girlfriend, and it was a uh, Green Bay Packers tweet about the bad referee. And those were the three most important Twitter topics in our country that year. And even since then, when you look at like uh, last year, last year the most popular news story on Twitter obviously was Ferguson, was, was all that. But the hashtags that come out of it, the, the you know, hands up, don't shoot, the Black Lives Matter, all the different parts of it, whether you believe in it or not, whether you believe in one side or the other, to see all of the factions speak out in hashtags, to see people get involved in different environments, to see social media come alive with what broadcasts, wrestling, what everybody's coming together, you start to see all that come together. I mean, even the last week, I mean, obviously, it's huge for journalism in, in other ways to talk about um, what happened in France with the terrorist attacks in France and with a lot of those different things. I mean, that's a whole other level of journalism and where you can go with journalism. But the, the hashtag, Je suis Charlie, is one of the most popular hashtags ever in the history of Twitter. And at one point, there's 6,500 tweets per minute just about that. And that was hours after a news developed in France. That was hours after a terror attack in France. You saw all this come out. You saw reactions. You saw newsrooms across the world uniting and holding up banners. And journalists were all of a sudden not these, you know, just mindless, thoughtless people. They, they all cared. They all came together. They banded together. And it meant more. And it's meant more for the journalism community. And because these journalists jump on and they do it, you've seen it just ripple across the globe. And it's, it, it's showing that journalists are getting a better grasp of how we use hashtags. Journalists are getting a better grasp of how we use all these things because it's, it's the only way we can really get beyond the bounds of, it's the only way that, you know, Matt talks about publishers and publishers not doing new things. I'm still getting my master's. I'm doing this because I didn't want to go into that. I didn't want to go to insurance and I didn't want to go to journalism. Those are my two options. So in, in journalism really wasn't an option. There, there isn't an option. And thankfully, you know, Dairy Queen and Dairy Queen South Dakota, my parents' Dairy Queen can help pay for our journalism because that's where journalism's at. That, that's the state that you need to have some kind of outlet. You need to, to do something new. You need to have some form of, of funding, some form of backing because it, it's a very limited market right now. It's a very limited market in what you can do journalistically and what um, 
in, in what you can get accomplished. But as I've learned and what we've been able to do, I mean, we're at the point where we're about to hit positive on cash flow. We're about to start signing our own checks. We're about to do all of our own things 100%. And it's because of our voice. It's because of our content. It's because of the message we had. Uh, Nebraska Athletics doesn't normally uh, credential third-party athletics or uh, websites unless they have a national backer. A national backer means ESPN, Yahoo, or Fox. And there are a bunch of different subsidiaries. They come from a bunch of different places, but it comes back to those three, basically. We're the first non-nationally backed website to ever be credentialed for football, and we're still the only one that's come up in all the other sports as well. So they've had that policy in place. No one's even using it. Everybody wants to sit at home, and then everybody in politics is a lot the same way. Everybody wants to sit at home and, and see the stuff they, that they see online and talk about it and debate. But the future of po politics and the media, the future of how the media can cover politics, can cover sports, can cover news, is not that we all need to be active. It's not that we all just need to be doing something. It's we need to go out there and do it. You need to go talk to your center. You need to you know, bring your phone in and record a rally. You need to do all these different things. Media and the ability to publish. The ability to publish, I mean, I went to Walmart to get everything ready to publish this in HD and use some stuff from the, stu the, student, sport, or, sorry, the student school uh, computer store. And if I got anywhere else, I would get the same stuff. And it's just like, you don't need a ton of stuff. You don't need a broadcast studio. You don't need an HD camera. You need an iPhone and a tripod, and you can start up your own television station online. You can start up your own radio station online if you get a $100 microphone to add to it. They're, the pieces that you need to be a journalist, to be part of the journalism community today, are, are, are so small in comparison to what they were five and 10 years ago that now it's just about the mindset, adhering to ethics, adhering to policies, adhering and, and understanding how journalism works. You don't have to have an education in journalism. We have three business majors of our 10 interns at Corn Fed Sports, and we're teaching them how it works. You don't need to have all class. I mean, it's nice, it is nice for me to come into here you know, five or six times a week and, and see all these awesome examples up here, but being in the field, being out there and doing it has taught me more than anything ever could in this classroom. And that's, that's the challenge to everyone. That's the challenge to everybody in the politics arena is that it's not just about wanting to get content and, and get your voice out there. It's about creating content. It's about creating a network. It's about using tools and using Snapchat, using Instagram, using all the stuff. It sounds crazy that people broke news on Instagram or that LeBron James announced that he's going somewhere else via a letter in Sports Illustrated. And, you know, media has a much different view of how it breaks news these days and how things come out. But if we just embrace it, if, if you just say, I mean, why should Instagram be used for politics? Why wouldn't you want 15 second video clips of hearing what your state senators are saying, keeping people accountable? Why wouldn't you want to be disseminating via these, these networks that have huge followings, especially to get to the youth? I mean, if we don't take these social networks serious, if we don't take where journalism is going seriously, and we don't put real content in that, how do we really expect the people that are using it, the people that are absorbing it, to, to really latch on? And so the, the future of the fourth estate and the estate that watches over the government, the estate that keeps the government honest, is in using the things that are available to us. We don't have to re I mean, we don't have have to rewrite any more than we have in the past five or ten years. I mean, more things are going to come up, but everything's digital. Everything's about your mobile phone. Everything's about what people can do from their phone. And and the publishing power that you now have from a cell phone, from an iPhone, from especially the new levels of iPhone. I mean, it, it's it's just it blows me away when I realize all the different things we can do. And it's to the point that I thought to myself, you know what? What if I was just like everyone else. You know, what if I wasn't me that wastes all my money on adapters and all different things? What if I just wanted to do something with my iPhone and, and make something um, something a little bit different than just what you normally see in video? So after driving for uh, 14 hours to the middle of the night, because I couldn't really afford a hotel, so that's journalism for you right there, uh, I got to San Antonio last year to cover the Nebraska men's basketball team um, in the NCAA tournament. Now, I think there's sound on here. I'm going to turn it off because I sound awkward. What matters is how it looks. So um, what you'll see, though, is that this video had no attachments, had no um, different production values. I shot, edited, and posted 100% of this video from my iPhone. So I had an iPhone 5S, and that's it. And here's what I came out with for my NCAA tournament report. If I can find. So this is actually the camera that's on the front of my iPhone. I set an iPhone on a tripod, I faced it towards me, and now you're watching it on this screen, fully blown up, and I, I, I think it's safe to say, <laughs> See, again, that's why I say I'm awkward. But this is exactly what it looks like on a TV, is where it was everything. This is a front-facing iPhone camera shot. This is a shot of my iPhone on a tripod. No audio adjustments, no you know, different things, I just had a tripod, that's it. So I had a steady shot, 
you know, coaches my South Dakota Coyotes, so I had to get him the shot. I knew you had the job a little bit early, so I could shot that video. Then interviews and lower thirds and things that seemed like, hold on, I need to agree to that kind of stuff. I need to, you know, have a lot of training. I need to have a big background. Why? Why do you? I mean, I, I held this and this dude's sitting down and I'm kind of like awkwardly crouched down. I didn't have a tripod for this one. And would you be able to tell the difference from the guys who were carrying $6,000 cameras if you just looked at it? I mean, some of those guys don't even know how to work their white balance to the point it doesn't matter what camera they have, it's not going to look good. So it's, it's, there's still a lot of issues in it. What if people just use their phone? What if, I mean, in this, you'll hear, he can, you know, it's not necessarily So I kept him talking over this thing so I could even edit you know, some more complex things like that. Now it's not great, it's not the best thing in the world. I'll turn it down here a little bit. I got to get the dramatic effect on the end. But um, it was just me saying, you know what? I, I want to get video. I want to get a report out there. I want to put myself in front of the camera. I want to be a journalist in the sense that, you know, I, I'm, I feel like I'm on TV. I feel like I'm doing something like that. And all it took was an iPhone and access and a tripod. And so here's, here's the conclusion. So he gets a half court shot. So I just waited long enough for that half court shot. But um, it, it, it's scary to me to think what the future is going to look like for journalists on some level simply because I've seen how easy it can be to do other things. I've seen how easy it can be to branch out, to do things that um, most journalists would think is crazy, to use your iPhone for a video that you're actually putting on YouTube or something like that. And so it's, it's scary on one level for me as a journalist to think, what if everybody catches up? What if everybody catches up and, and everybody can do this and citizen journalism becomes a real thing? But then on the other hand, I'm like, but why is that a bad thing? Why is that something you should be worried about? Why should you be worried about everybody having the ability to get their voice out there and be heard? If a journalist is good at what he does, it doesn't matter how many citizen journalists are on the case. Journalism is about doing something that serves the people, that, that is, transcends whether or not you think you did a good job. So if journalists aren't popular, maybe they're just not doing a good job. That's not a scary thing. That's not something that we should be worried about. And, and I'll end it with, with just kind of how I, I see the, the, the journalism world out there. And, in no way am I condoning this group. In no way am I saying that I'm friends with them. That that in every class I've had where we talk about mass media and society, mass media and, and athletes, all those kind of things, I've been the one guy who isn't really that mad that Anonymous exists. If you guys haven't heard of Anonymous, they're um, a, a, a hacktivist organization, a lot of people say. And I'm not saying I support them. But when, when you compare it to what our government's doing, when you compare it to some of those things, you don't want to know. You don't want to know a lot of those things, but they represent the idea that they started to do the same thing as the government does. They started to get into an infrastructure. They started to use the web to kind of get across some of their means. I'm not saying I support everything they do, but if we as a society said, you know what? We can use technology to counteract the government, to do some of the same things, to stand on their level. That's, that's the only hope we have. We, it's the only hope is we have a society to have our elected leaders hear us, to have politics work for us, is for us to be able to do to do things on our own, to do things without the government, without senators having to do a lot. We have to be able to supersede the system by what our voice says, by what social technology allows us to do, by what journalism empowers us to do. Because without journalists taking that information, or citizen journalists taking that information and putting it into capsules that we can understand, all this information is going to go to waste. And, and until we can find a way to hold a senator accountable for how he votes, until we can hold, you know, hold an elected official in a parking department accountable for tickets, until we can do those things on an immediate level and not have to wait and get a report in a PDF version. Um, actually, I got to make an application that displayed all the salaries and a check in that wage class. So I got to see exactly how that works. Luckily, he's the one who took the PDF and parsed it out for us. I never would have ever, ever done that on my own. That would have scared me beyond belief, and I wouldn't be able to figure it out. But we need that. We need people who can do those kind of things. And we need the, the, the digital fourth estate to rise up and say, we're going to use this information to keep you honest, and we're going to do it no matter what you say. And, and that's the future of journalism. It's just individuals and citizens and journalists alike coming together and saying, we have these technologies. We have these publishing powers in our place. Now it's about time we used it. So I probably won't be able to answer questions as, as, as well as anybody else. So I'm not going to take any unless anybody wants to force any on. But otherwise, thanks for listening. <laughs>
all over the place. So we have one more program. I'm going to reintroduce um, our presenter again. I'm not going to go ahead and read his, his whole uh, uh, bio, but we're going to welcome back up Matt Waite, and he's going to uh, give us uh, the final lecture of today, and it is going to be on, what is it going to be on? Lessons from PolitiFact. So thank you so much. Here he is. So, um, a lot of my background with politics in the web is centered around PolitiFact. And I want to give you the kind of PolitiFact creation myth right now, but someplace you have to, st the place you have to start with how PolitiFact came to being is you have to understand that I, in high school, was very, very interested in politics. And then somewhere along the way, I fell off the wagon. And I fell off hard, where I hate politics, hate it. Um, in the St. Pete Times newsroom where I was working for about 10 years, they had a, a wall of quotes that were all taken out of context from people in the newsroom. And somebody would say something, and if you took it out of context, it would be really, really funny. Um, on the wall for years and years and years was a quote from me that said, you know, somebody asked me a question, what would happen if the, the metro editors came and said, we want you to cover politics? I said, I'd rather serve fries. I really don't like it at all. So when the Washington bureau chief at the Times came to me and said, hey, I've got this idea of how we can cover politics differently, and I think it involves the web, and I think it involves databases, but I don't know anything about those things. You've got a minute? The grand irony was hatched. Um, PolitiFact, if you, how many, how many of you have seen PolitiFact? You've been there? People, all right, the rest of you, come on, get on the stick. Um, full disclosure, uh, I, I built it, uh, but I haven't worked there uh, or worked for them or consulted with them in several years uh, now. When I, when I joined the faculty here, it was uh, time to start putting stuff behind me and, and kind of move forward with some other things. So uh, they are all my friends. I view PolitiFact as my teenage child now in that it does things that really embarrasses me and I have to sit there and go, oh God, not again, stop it, please. And other ones, I'm, I'm very, very proud of it. So I can, my kids aren't teenagers yet, I can only imagine this is what it's gonna be like. Um, anyway, so you have a guy in Billadere who lives and breathes, is steeped in, bathed in, it goes through his mortal soul in politics, loves it. And me, can't stand this stuff. And we got to talking about how could we how could we do this? He wanted to cover politics differently. What he wanted to do was he wanted to fact check things that politicians were saying. But he wanted to break out of the journalist's conceit. And the journalist's conceit is basically this. Every newspaper, a lot of TV stations, they all have done during campaigns, they do the fact check or the ad watch or <coughs> something like that. I can tell you from experience, that assignment sucks. No one likes it. The editors usually bury it on 6B somewhere, uh, or it ends up at the, you know, the 11 o'clock uh, extra news program on a Sunday night on local television where nobody watches. So you know immediately that no one's going to care. The problem, and the reason why people don't care, is the way that this story has been done for a long, long time is you go and you look at a campaign ad, and then you get somebody to say, well, on the one hand, and then you get somebody else to say, well, on the other hand, and then you let the reader decide, which is the lazy way of going about it. The journalist just lays it out there and says, okay, you make up your mind. PolitiFact was going to be different. We were going to make a call. We were going to say, no, nope, this is true. And then we realized, wait a minute, this is politics. We can't just say it's true or false, because that's not how politics works. We need a finer gradation here. And we came up with true, mostly true, half true, mostly false, false, and everybody's favorite, pens on fire. 
I remain angry to this day that the URL was not pantsonfire.com. <laughs> Somebody had squatted on it and wanted 3,000 bucks for it. In hindsight, that was cheap. We should have just paid for it. And hell, I probably should have put it on my credit card and gone, here, do it. But no, we didn't do that. So it starts with a grand irony of, of two people who have never built a website before, of completely different viewpoints on political news, sitting down and talking about this. We got to talking about it, and the proverbial cocktail napkin comes out. And in May of 2007, we hatched this scheme. And I say scheme because this project was built on a computer that was supposed to be thrown away. I rescued it out of the trash reformatted the hard drive, put some server software on there, stuck it on my desk, and that's what it was built on. We never really had permission to start it from anyone. We just had an idea. And we mentioned it to our bosses that we were doing this, and they were all like, yeah, yeah that's, that's OK, that's interesting. But they didn't know we were working on an actual functioning prototype. The very first functioning prototype, um, it was called the Campaign Referee. And instead of meters, we had hand signals. And it looked like a footlocker had vomited on a page. It looked kind of awful. <laughs> Truly, I'm glad that that is just gone. That it is lost in the dustbin of history. Um, but then we presented the actual working prototype in a room. And suddenly, the whole conversation went from, it'd be nice if we did this, to, we can do this. And suddenly, the St. Petersburg Times, the largest newspaper in Florida, was very seriously talking about changing the way that it covered politics. I can remember very distinctly a meeting where the political editor said, well, wait a minute, we're not going to go to Iowa and follow Hillary around in a coffee shop, or we're not going to go to New Hampshire and follow uh, a Republican around a, a factory? And we're like, nope, we're going to do it differently. And he said, I'm done. Gets up, walks out. Still hasn't written anything for the site to this day. It was very different. People were very caught off guard by it. The real secret sauce behind PolitiFact is that it treats every story like a piece of data. The stories are not just headline, byline, body copy, and a photo maybe. There's actually a number, I'm, I'm going to blank on the number, it's like 35 different discrete pieces of data in there. We broke a story down to its atomic particles, and we rebuilt it. And what that does is it allows for us to mix and match and meld the content in ways. We can see all of the true things that uh, John Boehner has said and all of the false things that Barack Obama has said and vice versa. If you're a single issue voter, we can give you that single issue. Uh, you can look at any number of different things, uh, different ways that you can just kind of mix and match and explore the set on your own. The other thing is we realize that if we were going to be fact-checking American politics, Every individual item has its own value, but the meta-narrative also has a value. We can pile these things all together and create a much broader and more complex view of the truth of American politics this way. Along the way, I mean, we, we, we started this in May of 2007. We launched in August of 2007. We had absolutely no idea what to do then. We had no plans for what to do after it launched. We had a plan for how to turn it off. We decided that if the Florida primary came and went, and nobody was really paying attention to the site, and we weren't having any fun doing it, it would just go away and never be seen again, and we wouldn't mention it and be fine. It launched, and it had better traffic than pretty much everything except the homepage of the newspaper that day. And it took off like crazy. And we realized, oh crap. I can only imagine that the feeling that we had that day was the same feeling that a lot of ground commanders in the Iraq invasion had. Hey, uh, we've invaded your country. We got to Baghdad. What now? We had no idea. We had no idea what to do with success. We only had a plan for failure, which was not the best way to go about doing it. <laughs> Along the way, we learned a lot of lessons. When we started, as I said before, social just wasn't a thing. A few of us had Facebook accounts, but it wasn't capital F Facebook like it is now. A very, very, very few of us had Twitter accounts. Very few of us. I went to, I went to Bill Adair and said, hey, I started a Twitter account for PolitiFact. He's like, what's that? 
We thought we were being super duper high tech, future thinking people because I, and I programmed a way that we could easily embed YouTube videos into different stories because candidates had started, started putting their commercials onto YouTube around this time. So we thought, hey, we're with it. We can put videos on the internet. <laughs> we had no idea that we would fact check a Facebook post or a tweet at any point. We started our social media stuff completely by accident, just random. One person would get a wild hair and go do it. We started Twitter in September 2007. We had 300 followers for a good six months because all it was was just robotic tweets. It was a script. It was just dumping headlines in a link out there. And we had 300 people that followed it and eh. We didn't understand what Twitter was about. Now we have 197,500 followers plus, give or take, somewhere around that neighborhood. Facebook, we actually had a pretty good launch with Facebook. We got about 5,000 fans and we're like, this is awesome. 5,000, that's a big number. Now we have 392,000 plus now. We'll probably top 400K sometime here, maybe March-ish. Uh, and when the elections really start kicking up, when we, when we start, when we stop speculating about 2016 and we actually start seeing things happen, for 2016, it'll pick up again. Uh, if you care, Google Plus. Um, I used to put Google, Google Plus in here as a joke. It's actually not so much of a joke anymore. Uh, we have over 114,000 followers on Google Plus. That's a pretty solid number. I don't know how many of them are on Google Plus regularly. Any avid Google Plus users in here? Yeah, I didn't think so. Everybody <laughs> looked around them. <laughs> no, no. So along the way, we've learned a lot of lessons. And I'm going to try to boil them down and not bore you with a lot of uh, long war stories. But we learn lessons with our social presence, uh, a lot of them the hard way, that I want to share with you, uh, that if you are in these areas, it should be applicable to, to pretty much anywhere uh, that is interested in doing so. Number one is get in while no one's watching. You should have a culture of being a first adopter in social. You should be on a social channel long before the masses get there. Why? Because you can screw up when no one's watching. <laughs> if you are on a social network that nobody is watching or cares about, you can figure it out, you can screw up, you can do it wrong. And when the masses get there, you're pretty comfortable with it. And they're the ones that are getting used to it, screwing up and making mistakes. You've got your game tight at that point. So get there before anyone is watching. You might think it is the stupidest thing ever. I thought Twitter was the dumbest thing I'd ever seen in my life for at least three years that I used it. Then I developed sort of a love-hate relationship with Twitter. And uh, now I have somewhere north of like 6,000 followers and I'm on it pretty much every damn day. And I still don't know why, but Twitter is a thing. I find myself getting kind of old and crusty now when it comes to this stuff, because I'm not in charge of a, of, a, of a media site or anything like that. And I look at things like Snapchat, and I'm like, why? Or Yik Yak, or any of these other things that are out there that my students are all way into, and I'm just like, and I get kind of an old man kind of thing. I'm just like, that. You shouldn't do that. If you're in charge of social for anything, Get in there, sign up. They're all free, who cares? Get in there, figure it out, be good at it, and when the masses get there, you'll be the one that's expert at it, and they'll come to you. They will follow you. Lesson two, be human. Like I said with Twitter, when we first started out, it was all robotic. Nobody wanted to be in charge of our Twitter stream. The, 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 the notion of a social media editor didn't exist. It just flat did not exist. And so the robotic thing was a way for us to have a presence, a token presence, and with zero investment. Social media, I'm glad you're all sitting down when I say this, because it's truly profound and it would knock you over uh, if you were standing up. Social media is about being social, and being social one of the fundamental aspects of being a human being. 
We are a social species. People recognize when you are putting zero effort into being a human being, or you're not a human being at all. People respond to your humanity, to your voice, to being a person. You're not a brand, you're an identity. You have a personality, you have a voice, use that. If you think you can get away with automating your social presence, I assure you you're in for a, a, a bad time. Like I said, we started with 300 followers, we thought it was pretty great. Started over when the debates came, and I live tweeted the debate. We went from 300 followers to 3,000 followers in a night. When I did it again, we went from 3,000 to 9,000. And suddenly it was like, well, we can't ignore this thing anymore. We gotta get on here and we actually have to talk to our audience. We have to interact with them. Maybe they might be useful to us. When PolitiFact started, it was all reporter-based stuff. The facts that were being checked, the statements that were being checked, all came from reporters and editors, people who watched stuff, the occasional email here and there. Now it's, it's above 50% come through social channels. It's other people bringing stuff to us saying, hey, I saw this thing on this place at this time. Is it true? And we'll go after that. We'd much rather have that. We'd much rather have our audience actively involved. Some people actually go the extra mile and say, yeah, I found this report from the GAO that says this is complete crap. And we can look at it and go, what do you know? We can go forward with that. So be human. Be a human being. Dovetailing on that, you have to let your players play. All along, in developing PolitiFact, the thing that I was faced with most was time. Our reporters don't have time to be doing this. They don't have time to be fooling around with face tweets and you faces and my my spaces and whatever the heck. We shouldn't be doing that. We've got that all the time, all the time. So I rolled a uh, a little piece of software into the uh, administrative backend of PolitiFact where you could actually, while you're typing your story in there, type the tweet that was going to promote your story. You could just write it right there, and when you hit save and publish and send it out to the world, it send the tweet out. You never had to log into Twitter, you never had to look at anything, it just did it all automatically. The problem with that we learned right away is that there are people who are good at social media and there are people who are not good at social media. The people who are good at social media in your organization should be in should be in charge of and responsible for your social media presence. Again, I am glad you are seated with this earth-shattering news. Mm -hmm. We let some people who were just truly dreadful at social media be our voice. Thankfully for a mercifully short period of time, but it went very poorly very quickly. And they just didn't get it. And some people don't, and that's fine. That's fine. Don't let them near your social channels. Let them be good at what they're good at. Let other people do what they do well. Um, be humble. The tweet and the backlash come together awfully fast now. And the time between your screw-up and the world letting you know about it is in the microseconds anymore. Particularly with a fact-checking organization like PolitiFact, you have to be ready to say, my bad, we got that one wrong. Here's the correct information. Um, I see politicians doing this now all the time. Um, I see, there was one um, just a couple months ago now uh, where John Boehner, or whoever runs John Boehner's Twitter account, probably more accurately, tweeted that the Senate needed to pass this bill that the House just passed. Why won't they give it a vote? And um, whoever runs Chuck Schumer's Twitter account got on there and said, we did six months ago. Here it is. You should pay attention. And people went nuts with that. What did John Boehner do? Nothing. Nothing. I don't know if there's anything he really could do. But if you're a human being, 
you are fallible. You will cultivate more trust among your audience being humble and admitting when you screwed something up. And that could be really minor. It could be a minor thing. You tweet out the wrong URL. Whoops. <coughs> Sorry about that. Here's the correct URL. I'm going to go get a second cup of coffee. That right there, that second cup of coffee line, will build a greater trust among your audience than anything else. Than anything else. The last one is evaluate and reevaluate. These things change quickly. And your strategy that you are trying now will not be the one that you're trying in a few years. I'll give you an example. PolitiFact.com, the main website, had comments on them for 14 minutes. 14. I clocked it. We had been going through a bitter debate amongst all of us who are building this thing about whether or not these comments were going to, or about these stories, these fact checks we're going to have comments on. I, being somewhat stubborn, rolled an entire comment platform into the software behind. I was not asked to do this. I did it because I thought it was the right thing to do. And it had all kinds of uh, moderation systems and all kinds of neat stuff that nobody ever saw because we had comments for 14 minutes. In the 14 minutes that we had comments, we got three of them. We were called liberal, um, let's just say a rather crass way of saying somebody who provides oral sex. We were called uh, conservative Nazi uh, four-letter word twits. And then somebody, I can only hope, because it took 14 minutes, copied and pasted a book length, literally book length explanation about how Hillary Clinton actually murdered Vince Foster <laughs> in a park. That he did not commit suicide, it was blood on Hillary's hands. Book length. The executive editor came running into my office and said, why are there comments on there? And I said, I thought we agreed to have comments on there in the last meeting. He said, no, we agreed to not have comments on there in the last meeting. And what he said was, I do not want our reporters to spend hours of their lives fact-checking something and then have us open up open mic night for every nutbag that comes along and just says, no, you're wrong. I think he's right and he's wrong, even to this day. Later on, when we lost a Facebook presence, that suddenly became our content, our comment platform. And he was immediately back going, Ugh, I don't like this. But I said, give it, a, give it a bit. Let it run. See how this goes. We had to reevaluate. We were criticized a lot for not having feedback mechanisms that were open and public. And it's worked out OK. It's worked out OK. Facebook suffers from what I called before the a-hole problem. If you're an a-hole, and everybody knows you're an a-hole, there's no social cost to you being an a-hole on Facebook. None. Everybody knows you all. So people are going to do that. And when you're talking about national politics, and you're talking about calling a politician a liar on the national stage, I assure you, you're going to get some very colorful responses. You should see the PolitiFact inbox. A sixth lesson I'll give you real quick. Answer your email. No matter how vile and disgusting, answer your email. I have seen emails come in to PolitiFact that are like, you bleepity bleeping bleepers, I hope your mother gets cancer, you fascist dog, pig, scumbags, whatever. How could you say that the president saying the sky was blue was true? There was very clearly one single cloud in the sky. The best you could say was mostly sunny. I have found that if you respond and just say, hey, Thanks for reading. 
if you look at this link here, it will show you where we base this on, and it said that the sky is blue. You'd be amazed at how often you'll get a response back that says, oh, hey, thanks. I uh, really appreciate you responding. I uh, love your site. <laughs> <laughs> People often scream and yell because they don't believe a human being is on the other side. If you present a human face to them in response, they will wilt. Not all the time, but 90% of the time. I'm also of the firm belief that you could win every possible Nobel Prize ever invented, every Pulitzer, every Emmy, every Academy Award ever. Like They would give you all of the awards if you could invent a button that just forwarded a vile email to that person's mother. <laughs> you need a massive database of mom's email addresses. If somebody sends you a vile email, you just hit a button, it goes straight to their mom, <laughs> things would get clean on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> we don't have that. So you constantly have to evaluate and reevaluate what you're doing. You can't set your social media policy in place in 2008 and expect it to work in 2014 or 2015, 2018. Constantly be evaluating these things. You'll, be, you'll find that you'll get more out of social, you'll get more out of the internet by doing these things, by being humble, being human, evaluating what you're doing, Letting people who are good at social be social, you'll get more out of it than you'll get negative out of it. With that, any questions? Yeah. Uh, so it's still early, obviously, but it seems to me that, that WeVote is checking most of these boxes. Um, yes. Do you what do you um, what do you feel are the strengths and weaknesses and the most important things for WeVote? Uh, to do going forward to make sure you're successful? Um, I think there's some minor things that can be done. Uh, I think the uh, verification of users is absolutely vital. I think that really sets people <coughs> apart. It's a fascinating exercise that if there is a mass of people that gets to use it, I think it will create, there, there, are, there are masters projects and probably PhDs in this somewhere um, as it goes forward. I think that process could be a little uh, more frictionless. Um, I think one of the options to verify who you are is to provide a picture of your driver's license. I saw this the other day and I raised the issue to them. I'm like, yeah, people are going to really freak out about that. I'm, like, I'm, I'm already like, hold on. You want what? Um, that could be a little more frictionless. Uh, I'm curious to see how it plays out when they expand to a larger state. I think Nebraska still does have, the, the maximum of all politics is local still works in, in Nebraska. I don't know if that's the same for the city of Chicago. Does even on a city level, um, let alone in a, in, a, in a state like Illinois. Uh, I'll be fascinated to see how that works. I think that attaching so much social capital to an individual, clear identity, their status as a voter is, is, a, is a truly brilliant thing to do, and I think it really could do a lot for discussion. The, the real question will be, can, can you get critical mass? Can you get enough people on there that there's a robust community that keeps people coming back, that there's enough going on there that uh, people will use it regularly and be engaged in the process? Or is it going to be something where they're going to get really hot about a single thing, they're going to come in there, they're going to come and they're going to do their thing, and then they're gone. Um, I think legislators will notice that. And they're kind of, how seriously they will take what's going on in Weibo will, will ebb and flow based on how active people are on there. So the more that, that Weibo can do to keep people on there and keep them engaged and keep them involved in things, I think, uh, will really matter. I, I, I mean, talking with some of the senators before, I, I think it's, uh, you can map things that we vote is doing to old school retail politics. Like my dad on the school board in Blair. There are people around town who know a lot, who he respects, that if they came up to him and said, you know, I think this. He's going to listen. He's going to really listen, and he's going to give that a lot of thought. And then there are people that he either doesn't know or have a reputation of being a little wackadoo, and if they come up and say something, 
And this is just an online version of that. I think people will establish social capital on WeVote by the eloquence of their arguments, the uh, amount of evidence that they can provide about a thing. Someone's just going to get on there and just, you know, untap the end here and just start typing. Yeah. But if somebody, you know, puts links in there, <coughs> hey, here's a report, here's this thing from this think tank, I think senators would be wise to take a look at that and say, okay, this person invested time in this. They must, they're, they're interested in this. This would be interesting. So it's it's going to be fun to watch. It's going to be a lot of fun to watch. But yeah, that verification thing is, is, is I think, the killer feature of the site. Glitterback is nothing like it. <laughs> and it's a lot of it flying out of people's heads. So I've learned some really new, effective swear words that way. <laughs> so, yeah, if you ever want to really get somebody mad, call their favorite politician a liar. You call the other guy a liar, they're your best friend. We had John Boehner one week tweet that we were, um, what do you say we were? Um, conscientious uh, and uh, thoughtful journalism on Monday. And Wednesday, we were uh, a sewer of the liberal elite. <laughs> because we gored somebody else's ox on Monday, and we gored his on Wednesday. Like we went from heaven to hell in an awful hurry. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, what's your definition of critical mass? I mean, how, how many people, how many users, how, how often, in order to make a site like this uh, function and, and start to carry some weight with the legislators? I don't know, is my honest answer. I couldn't give you a number. But I think you'll know it when you start to get civil back and forth. When you start to see votes on bills that are 53 to 47, or 51 to 49, and the numbers of votes you know, it's pretty substantial. We're not talking, you know, three to two here. We're talking, you know, 30 to 40 or, you know, 35 to 37, something like that. And you've got people actually making impassioned and civil arguments between them. And if that happens on bills regularly, I think that will, that's, that's when you'll know you have critical mass. That this thing is going to just start to sustain itself. Um, how do you achieve that? Boy, uh, I'm in academia, so clearly I've washed out of an enemy school. No, okay. <laughs> um, I think uh, I think WeVote would do a lot to try to connect the activity on WeVote to other social channels. The difficulty of creating a site like this is you are trying to get people to go somewhere else and be somewhere else when they are already on social media somewhere. So how can you start to get them to bounce back and forth between them? You're not going to get my mom off Facebook. You're not. I could have a pearl handle 45 to her head, and she's still going to update her status. But I can get my mom to click on something, bounce off of Facebook, and come back. She'll do that. Um, I have friends who are, like, I honestly wonder how they get anything done during the day. They're on Twitter so much. They're ping-ponging around the, the internet all over the place. So you can get them to kind of move around. That's the, that's the trick. And I think that, so Weibo can do a lot to do that. But once you start to see significant votes on significant issues and civil discussion going back and forth between people, I think that's when you'll have achieved critical mass. Yeah. Which five Americans should be permanently enshrined in the Hall of Fame for Pants on Fire? <laughs> <laughs> um, do they have to be Americans or people? Because chain emails would rocket to the worst of the worst right away. PolitiFact fact checks a lot of chain emails, and believe it or not, people still forward a lot of really terrible chain emails. Like that's still a significant vector of BS. So I'd pick that number one. Um, oh 
boy. Uh, Michelle Bachman <laughs> is going to rock it to the top. Uh, Sarah Palin was not doing well for a good long time. Honestly, I'll, I'll tell you the truth. There was a uh, there was an honest debate. Um, honest and, and joking debate um, in, in the PolitiFact offices about whether or not we should fact check something that Michelle Bachman said that was just blindingly obvious. Like, I'm a representative. True, okay, fine. <laughs> <laughs> just kind of, you know, give her a three foot putt there. Um, <laughs> everything we did was just wrong. It was just so bad. Um, on fire page. Um, I'll be honest with you, the the the, the people that you uh, that you want to, to hate, whatever your whatever your political leanings are, the people that you view as being oh they're awful, um, they probably aren't. The leadership, honestly, most of the things they say are so thoroughly vetted and laundered and and washed through consultants that it always has a tinge of truth to it. They're not the ones saying completely wackadoo stuff. Um, so if you look at their records, so um, yeah, Peter King's actually a fairly reliable source here. May not make these moves, mm -hmm. Or is my butt hurt? Take you to Peter King's scorecard here. Yeah, we haven't done very much in him. But um, you know, Harry Reid, uh, John Boehner, Mitch McConnell, uh, folks like that. You know, your kind of name brands. John McCain. They're all a big mush. They're all a big middle. They say enough true stuff. They say enough false stuff. It just kind of all washes out. It's the kind of fringy people. The other, the other ones that are really, really bad are uh, pundits. Uh, it got so bad that uh, PolitiFact actually launched an entire website dedicated to it called Pundit Fact um, because there was just so much crap and it was particularly, um, it was uh, radio. AM radio was just a wash of stuff. Um, I'll tell you what, when, when when Glenn Beck left Fox and went to his online news thing and just kind of disappeared, it was a, that was a sad, sad day at, at Glenn Beck. He was always a good source of some good stuff. So um, Sarah Palin in her, in her vice presidency, her vice presidential campaign was a, a pretty good source. Um, she doesn't have a, a great uh, record. Uh, yeah, boy. I have to think about it. I haven't, I haven't looked in a while, but I'm pretty sure that Michelle Bachman's in the Hall of Fame. Like, her batting average is low. I should find her real quick. So you can see what I'm saying. saying that Mitt Romney put socialized benefits in place. Yeah. I could, so <coughs> false and pants on fire make up, uh, what is that, 62% uh, of the things. Uh, if you add mostly false in there, it gets to 75% of the things that we fact checked uh, from her. If we wanted to compare that to the president, we've got a ton on him, 15% in the false or pants on fire. The danger with doing this, by the way, is that PolitiFact does not fact check everything that every politician says. Every word, every sentence, every paragraph out of their mouth, it's impossible. You couldn't do that. So this is a really, 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 really flawed sample of things. 
Um, and there is a, a, a parlor game online trying to find bias in all of this and bias in selection and all that. In fact, um, if you go to Google and you go to search, <laughs> PolitiFact bias is the number two. So, so yeah, I'd have to think about it to give you an actual top five list. But I can tell you that Facebook posts, email chain, chain email letters, um, AM radio pundits, and uh, Michelle Bachman. <laughs> pretty much up there. Yeah. I would think, given that we're talking about new frameworks for mm -hmm. developing media, um, I've always thought it would be a very nice idea to have a blog. I'm going to call it a blog. It could be whatever. Mm -hmm. A policy blog, where it, the criteria would be, so, so whoever the organizational feature is, would have a series of questions that they're working on, you know, for, from a, a real need standpoint to come up with answers. And uh, they would come up with a first round of input where these where, where the sole requirement is that they have to be factually based. Hmm. Yeah. I think policy gets short shrift online a lot because it requires a depth of knowledge and it requires a willingness to read. And on the internet right now, that's um, we have talked in classes and uh, in media development classes, and I talked with uh, media companies about how can we um, create sites that can engage people on issues like policy uh, and do it in a way that doesn't make it like eating your vegetables. Um, could you do games around policy? Could you do um, some other kind of structure <coughs> other than long narratives. Uh, well, well absolutely. You couldn't get into, you know, you'd have to put it in readable form. Yeah. Well, you know? what, does that, well, what does that look like and how do you do that without completely um, oversimplifying complex policy issues? Um, so, you know, keeping uh, general principles. I mean, you know, what, what, is, what is it, what are the, I mean, one of the questions might be, what are the problems associated with law? Yeah. You know, yeah. and so you've got this input coming in, and then the second round would be uh, discussing whether or not you know these are valid yeah. points because you, there's a difference between facts and opinions. So, that, but my point is is that um, I, that would I guess that would be the second requirement is that it would have to be user friendly that you could have two different versions of your policy, mm -hmm. one for the wonks, but one has to be targeted. For the, for the everyday voter. Yeah. I, uh, I actually, on a wild hair one holiday, um, I built a PolitiFact commenting system that I called the Court of Appeals. And it was based on this, this, this very basic idea. It would take a, a PolitiFact item, and then it would let you establish how you, uh, how you fell on this. Did you agree or disagree? Uh, were you on the left or you on the right? And then you had to factually establish your disagreement using links and then um, people would vote on the arguments and there'd be a, a timed period where that vote could go on and then whoever's argument got the most votes won um, and yeah, nobody bought into it so it sits in a code repository somewhere on my computer but um, yeah, those those are issues that are really really tough. Like how how can you get? But it's the core of what our problem is. I know, right now. and that's yeah, and that's that that's what makes the problem even worse, is that we have so many people that have tuned out <coughs> policy, um, and getting them back into it is going to be hard. Um, well, don't you think part of it, um, the reason that's true, is because it's more sensationalistic to come up with you know, harebrained, crazy stuff. That that's yeah, I mean, it's, in it's, this environment that we create. Yeah, it's it it's easier to move people on emotion than it is on fact. Period in the graph. Um, so 
uh, with the attention span, particularly on social media, being so short, there's no point. There's no point in trying to engage on facts. So yeah, it's it's all all a lot. Um, and like I said, really really hard issues. Is there anyone else? Or I think we're right. Just comment on critical mass that was asked before. Mm -hmm. uh, I view Vivo more of a, the the engine, the highway, the the, the way to put people in you know, in touch with their legislator. Mm -hmm. uh, with critical mass, we're only looking at how many users are using the system. You know, one could say that Twitter, and Facebook reached uh, critical mass a long, long time ago. Sure. In my opinion, they didn't until you know, the media started using it, politicians started using it. And you've got other people in the business world recognizing, hey, this is a way to contact and be in touch with my point, the people out there. And that's why the, with Bebo, Bebo, when we start hearing our legislators saying, well, I just checked Bebo this morning, and this is what I heard. Then you know we made it. Yeah, agreed. Uh, I mean, you look at Twitter. There's a, there's a, weekly, uh, a weekly hashtag game on The Tonight Show yeah. on Twitter, yep. which, as a guy who grew up watching Johnny Carson, that's like, what? <laughs> so, yeah, I, I, I agree. Anyone else? Thank you very much for your time. Yeah.